Good morning, Saints. Welcome to Worship of Christ our Savior Lutheran Church. On this, the fifth Sunday after of Lent, it is a blessing to be with you this morning. It is our hope and our prayer, as per usual, that you would be comforted and consoled, uplifted and inspired in worship this morning. I invite you all to please stand. We'll begin our service in song. Our lives are often marked by merriment, but beneath looms the other. Our worry, our sorrow, our shame, our guilt, our grief. Let us hand over all that to the one who offers us not condemnation, but joy. In this moment, as my mind wanders, God directs my thoughts to you. In this week, as I walk your path and sometimes stumble, in our community, where we have sometimes remained silent, in this world where there is much hurt, hurt that we sometimes cause, in this time where there is much sorrow and grief, In these moments of silence, <laughs> siblings in Christ, God is not done with us yet, not by a long shot. God loves you more than you can know. God is working in you to make you new and to bring you to new life. Christ died to save us from sin, death, and ourselves. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be at peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters our desert. Open our hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing, so that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love given to all through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Won't you please be seated for the distribution of Holy Communion. If it is indeed your preference, we continue to, uh, we continue to be able to offer communion to you in, in prepackaged communion kits. If that is your desire, if that is your preference, simply make your will known, and one of our ushers will be glad to bring you communion in your seat.
compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. morning. The first reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 43. Thus says the Lord who makes the way in the sea, 
a path in the mighty waters, who brings our chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do not perceive it. I will make the way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. The second reading is taken from Philippians chapter 3. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the readings. Holy Gospel according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. I'd like to invite the children to come forward with your noisy offering and for the children's message, please. Hey. Good morning, good morning. Hello, friends. I'm so happy to see so many of you this morning. Good morning, good morning. Oh, good. Thanks for coming up, Max. Wow. I, I am so 
so excited to see all, all of you. Ah, you're right, Connor? All right. Oh, good. Josh, you want to come over here and sit next to Max? Because I have two handsome assistants here with me this morning. So could you hold on to that sure. for a moment? All right. So this morning, we just heard about how Mary used expensive perfume to wash Jesus' feet. Can I ask you a question? How many of you hear your mom say, go wash your feet before supper? Do any of you hear that? No. What do they say? Go Who's going to? Go wash your hands before you Say it louder. Go wash your hands before supper. Yeah, go wash our hands before supper because they're what? Dirty. Well, guess what? In Jesus' time, if you had money, you wore sandals. If you didn't, you were barefoot. I'm just going to say that's my kind of place. I prefer <laughs> to be barefoot or in sandals. But they also didn't sit and eat at the dining room table. How many of your parents make you sit on the floor to eat? No. In Jesus' time, they sat on the floor. So not only, I mean, so what's, if you're sitting there and the food's right before you, what, what's right in front of your feet? Supper. Yuck, right? Dirty feet. So the custom was to wash your feet. We're going to learn more about that come Holy Week. But I, so how many of you, I have a teenage son. I have two great teenagers sitting here next to me. How many of you have smelly feet when you take off your shoes? I won't look. All right, could you open that for me, Josh? Max, could you hold the basket? Could you open it? And I'm going to pass half around and wrote... What does this smell like to all of you? How many of you think this smells delicious? Can you guys hand that out? Pa pass it around. What does it smell like? Onion. Yeah, does it smell good or is it kind of stinky? Yummy. Yummy. How many of you, how many of you men would like your wife to wear onion perfume? Uh, no. All right. So we have some, I'll take, want to pass those top four the other way? Okay, it smells strong. It smells kind of stinky. That's kind of like our feet. I'm going to say, that, oh, you didn't smell it. This is like Judas's feet, or heart. I'm sorry, Judas's heart. It's kind of smelly. He's a little mad that Mary has used this expensive perfume and um, wasted it. Now, I want you to smell this. This is frankincense. You want to pass that around, Jackson? Here's another one with frankincense. You want to smell it and pass it around? How does that smell? How many of you remember one of the gifts? The gifts that the wise men brought was one of them was one of them frankincense gold frankincense and myrrh yes this smells beautiful some of it is mint yep but does it smell better than the onion yes that was mary's heart mary's heart smells like the peppermint in the frankincense her heart was right before god she wanted to not only wash jesus's feet but she wanted to bless him with that sweet aroma while Judas had a grumpy heart. We'll talk about this a little bit more in Sunday school. All right, will you guys pray with me? Dear God, help us to have a beautiful smelling heart just like Mary. Help us to make good choices and to do the right thing. And all of God's people said what? Amen. Amen. Let's head off to Sunday school. I admit that I was preparing myself for a rousing rendition of Trick or Treat, Smell My Feet, Give Me Something to Eat. <laughs> another day, another children's sermon. Hmm. I find that there is, um, I find that there is an exquisite 
redundancy to Scripture that does two things, I think, for us. Um, there is an exquisite redundancy to Scripture that makes it at the same time, occasionally, both boring and an endless well of hope. What I mean when I say boring is really only that so very often when you hear a thing repeated, you just lose a little bit of sensitivity to the messaging. And everything that we do here, though, revolves around the telling of a familiar story. And maybe we can simply sum up the story like this. God makes all things new. God makes all things new. <clears throat> Pardon me. We encounter that message all throughout Scripture. All of Scripture announces that proclamation. Everything that we do, even in how we construct our worship services, announces that proclamation. God makes all things new. We see that story all over Scripture. From Abraham to Noah to Jonah, David, Ruth, and on and on and on. God makes all things new. Of course, for us as Christians, we hear that message announced most clearly through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. God making all things new in a way that is, that is beyond all of us, beyond reason, most wonderfully. Our storytelling even this morning from Isaiah in the epistle, from Paul's letter to the church of Philippi, and our gospel continue with that message, God makes all things new. We can't get away from it. I hope it is redundant. Because we need to hear that good news over and again. We need to hear that good news over and again because that messaging that God makes all things new, the way that we hear that in the stories of Scripture, it needs to become our story. We need to know that the stories that we tell about what God is up to are the same as it's been forever and ever and ever. <coughs> Our scripture this morning tells the story that God makes all things new. We hear it first in our Old Testament reading from Isaiah, the beautiful poetry of Isaiah. Israel, still living in exile, hears a word from God. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. Already Isaiah invoking Israel's own scriptural memory of what God has been up to in their lives. Isaiah already calling to mind for Israel what God has done for them by invoking the imagery of the exodus from Egypt into the promised land going through the Red Sea. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior, they lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. You see, God makes all things new. Those stories become our stories. Do not remember the former things of old, Isaiah says, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the desert, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. God's newness for Israel 
is resurrect, excuse me, is, is restoration from exile. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I actually kind of think that it must have been hard for them to perceive the new thing that God was doing. Because so very often when God is doing, doing a new thing, making a way in the wildernesses of our lives, offering us water in the desert of our lives, it doesn't feel like a new thing. It just feels bad. We don't necessarily want the new thing. We want the thing that we know, even if we know that the thing that we know isn't the good thing for us. Sometimes when God calls us forward into a new future, it's a challenge, to say the least. But the nature of God, but the nature of God is to make all things new, and we as part of God's creation are not actually given a real choice in the matter. I suppose we can stomp our feet and pitch a tantrum, but God's made the way, and we'll go. It is tough to perceive the new thing that God is doing in our midst, as I said, because sometimes we're so attached to a given thing that we're not interested in the new thing. But it's still important for us to consider the question about what God is up to, where God is leading us, where God is present in our midst and what it means for us as individuals, as a congregation, and as communities. Um, once upon a time, I was having a wonderful conversation with a, with a, a, a trusted mentor, and it was a question about, um, if you ever, uh, so, so pastoral secret, when, when, you, when, when pastors end up with pastoral mentors, you end up with people who always ask you, question, you, who always ask you the question, where do you see God at work in your life? I think that's where we learn to ask that question to all of you. You can't get away from it. Where, where do you see God at work in your life? Anyhow, I was having a conversation with a mentor, and my mentor was asking me this question, where do you see God at work in your life? And I struggled a bit, but the conversation was wonderful, and, and, and what he shared with me are two things that I remember. He said, if you want to know what God is up to in your life, he said, first of all, you have to look to the margins. Look to the margins. And what he, and what he meant was, you have to... You have to look to the margins of your own interior life and look to the margins of where you feel maybe a little bit unsettled about where you might be, where you might be being invited to go in your life. And maybe that's a place where you can perceive God. Relatedly, relatedly, God's presence is also discoverable beyond the margins of our interior life. God's presence is discoverable at the margins of our community and the margins of our world. We know very well, we know very, very well that we often drag our feet when we are called to those places because those places are, by definition, challenging for us. They make us uncomfortable. But the last thing that my, my mentor shared with me is that if you want to know where God is at, where, where you can see God at work in your life, he said, simply pay attention to the people that God has brought into your life most recently. Look to the margins and look to the people who have come into your life and there you will know what God is up to. And there, there, maybe there, you will perceive the new thing that God is doing in your midst. Maybe you will perceive the new thing that God is up to and that God is inviting you towards or the way in which God is inviting you to grow. Maybe as an individual, maybe as a congregation, maybe as a broader community, that God is about to do a new thing, that God, makes things, that, that God makes all things new, is a repetitive, beautiful message that we receive time and again. We talked about it from Isaiah. We hear it in our gospel reading this morning. God is about to do a new thing. God is about to do something very, very new in the death and resurrection of Christ. But it certainly does not seem like it the first time you encounter the story. The first time you encounter the story and you don't know how it all turns out, you know what that story seems like, you know what it looks like, it just looks like death. And it smells just like the death that Lazarus died. When Jesus shows up to raise Lazarus from the dead, Mary, and, and he gives the command to have the stone rolled away from Lazarus' tomb, Mary says, no, Lord, 
No, Lord, it's already been three days. There's a stench. Sometimes when God is about to do a new thing, that's the only thing that fills our nostrils is the stench of what's been dead around us and in our heart. Sometimes the new thing that God is doing in our midst isn't perceivable until it is on full display in our midst, just like the resurrected Christ. Sometimes the new thing that God is up to smells like perfume that has been poured over the feet of a Jewish preacher. So, Christ our Savior, God is doing a new thing here in your time of congregational transition. Do you perceive it yet? Do you know how God is calling you into your future to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world? Do you know how Christ is inviting you all to examine the margins of your heart and the margins of your community to discover where God might be hiding in plain sight? Do you all Do you all know what God is up to here at Christ our Savior? Have you been paying attention? Have you been paying attention to who's been coming into your life here at Christ our Savior? God is surely present, inviting you into a new future in order that the work that you share in might be to the glory of God. God makes all things new all things new, even the things that to us seem dead and worth leaving behind. God makes all things new. May God continue to open our hearts and our eyes and our ears that we might perceive the new thing as it springs forth. Amen. Let us confess our faith together by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we receive our offering.
Holy One, you have given yourself to us in Creator, in Christ, in the Spirit. We now give back to you this money that seems so little, this worship that seems so small, these words that never quite get it right. Receive what we offer and transform it by the power of your Spirit into Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord Jesus, you remind us this day that the most precious things in life are not things. Help us set our priorities by putting love and kindness ahead of greed and pride. Let us place our trust and faith in you, our anointed one. Fill us with your spirit as we desire to know you more not by matters of reason and logic, but by deeply holding you close to our heart as our Savior. Work through us to share your message of love, to bring about hope in this world that desperately needs to hear this good news. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Almighty Creator, we give you thanks for all your creation and for all the diversity in the world. We are grateful for each and every day for each day is a gift from you. We are thankful for the signs of spring, for the longer days, for the warm sunshine, for the birds chirping, and the flowers as they begin to sprout. The newness of life reminds us that the past is gone and what is new lies ahead. We thank you for our homes, for our friends, and our loved ones, and for all these things we share with grateful hearts now. Receive our thanks, Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Merciful God, you know the needs of your people. May you work in this world to bring peace and wholeness to our lives and our communities. We pray this day for leaders, educators, doctors, therapists, and caregivers who show compassion and provide care to ease suffering and bring about healing. We pray this day for all who need your care as they live with illness or are awaiting recovery. We pray for Colette Brown, Mary Fick, Ruth Peacock, Colleen Bergelman, Marcella Kruger, Sue Jarman, and for all those who we lift up to you now. Hear their prayers and ours. Bring them all they need. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your faithfulness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Creator who fashions us together with all things, the Christ who leads us into a new, beloved community, the Spirit who holds us in the communion of saints, one God, bless you, now and always. Amen. Won't you please be seated for a few announcements. It most likely has not escaped your notice this morning that Pastor Joe does not look like Pastor Joe today. <laughs> Pastor Joe is away for a little bit of vacation time. We were so grateful to have Amy Birkin, who is our Director of Adult Discipleship and Outreach, uh, 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 join us as worship assistant today. Not only is she the director of these things, but of course also Amy is a seminarian. So we give thanks for Arnold, uh, who is an assistant to the bishop here in the Greater Milwaukee Synod Office. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us, uh, joining us in worship, worship this day. Pastor Jennifer also is our Synod Liaison during the call process. So thank you, Jennifer. All right. Amy, you want to take the rest away? Good morning. Good morning. A few announcements for you today. Um, coming up this Friday is our Lenten fish fry. It is this Friday, April 8th, and it is from 5 o'clock to 6.30. 
Um, there's the opportunity to dine in, or otherwise you can take orders to carry out. It's $10, and it's going to benefit the Bready Healing Program. Um, we are in need of a couple people to help when it comes to like selling tickets and helping with preparations and serving the food and cleaning up afterwards. So if you're able to come and help as well, that would be wonderful. You can sign up on Sign Up Genius or you can let me know after the worship service. But I invite everyone to come for Fish Fry for Food and Fellowship on Friday. Also during the week, we continued our midweek um, worship service on Wednesdays at 6.30. It's a quiet, reflective service, so it's just time to come and pause during our Lenten season. Um, we are doing a dollar a day during Lent, so as you've been contributing your dollars, whether you do that in a bowl at home on the kitchen table or in other ways, um, there will be envelopes to put your um, dollar a day into, and then you can drop those off at Easter. And then reminder that if you are interested in purchasing uh, flowers uh, for the Easter, that uh, the last day that you can do so is today. Today is the deadline. There's a sign up in the Narsex to purchase those Easter flowers. And then our Easter extravaganza event is coming up on April 10th. That's next Sunday after Palm Sunday, so I hope you join in for that. And one last announcement, our first communion class today, if you're participating in that, you want to go all the way down to the north end of Fellowship Hall, and you'll find Kim there. So those are my announcements this morning. Now I invite you to stand for our closing song. Go in peace, Jesus meets you on the way.